grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. My fellow redeemed, you're in my seat. No, that one's mine too. Yep, the whole table, mine. Why don't you go sit over there? I'm sure they have room at their table. The bully's cronies were guffawing behind him as the new kid picked up his lunch and his tray and went to find another seat. He would have thought that in such a large lunchroom with so many people, there would have been more than enough room for everyone. It shouldn't be so hard. But each group had chosen its own territory, and he didn't have a group. Nearly all animals are territorial, but few more so than humans. You don't need to find no trespassing signs to realize this. We can be territorial about just about anything. Favorite fishing spots and hikes, booths at a restaurant or pews in a church, our turn to speak, our ideas, our friends, anything we value, we will protect and defend. It's in our nature to try to cast aside and throw out the outsider. Herod fought tooth and nail for his territory. He wasn't called the great because he was so magnanimous, but because he had ruthlessly, ruthlessly carved out this area and he ruled it with an iron fist. He destroyed anyone who got in his way, including his own brothers and sons. Judea was his. He was the king of the Jews. And then these rich sages showed up. They were talking about stars and about a king and about a baby and all of Jerusalem was disturbed and for very good reason because no one got between Herod and his power. The new king had to go. The sad and terrible events of our lesson today they prepare us to understand all of Jesus' life and his work. People are territorial. And God's Son was entering the most fiercely guarded territory of all. God's Son was in the world. That title, Jesus of Nazareth, was something that his enemies would hang on him because what good could possibly come from there? Today, we not only see the events that brought Jesus to that place, but we learn about his life and his work. He is Jesus of Nazareth, God's son in the world. He saves the world that hates him, and he fulfills all that God had spoken. The Magi gave that family reason to rejoice with great wonder. They came to worship the king. But then as soon as they left, Joseph dreamed another dream of an angel. And this time it wasn't good news. Get up. Take the child. Take his mother. Get going. Run. Flee. Get away. Go to Egypt and stay there until I send for you because Herod is going to search for the child. He intends to kill him. Get away now. So Joseph did. Immediately, maybe even that very night, they packed up their essentials and they went. You know, traveling with a child at night can be challenging, to say the least. Traveling with a tired toddler at night can be quite miserable. And yet, they went. They whisked, Joseph packed them all up and whisked them away to Egypt. 
He didn't call ahead for reservations. He didn't have anyone waiting for him there. He didn't know where they would go. He didn't know where they would stay. He didn't know what they would do when they got there. He didn't know how long they would be there. He didn't know anything that they would need. All he knew was God told him to go. So faithful Joseph went. And we see that Herod was not a nice man. He was so cruel, in fact, that history barely notices this particular atrocity. A few dead children in Bethlehem, well, that was barely an outrage by Herod's standards. So as soon as he figured out that the wise men were coming, weren't coming back, maybe he had some of his informants tell them that they had left his land completely. He flew into a rage. He called for his most vicious and his most loyal men, and he sent them, Go to Bethlehem and destroy all the boys there all those who are two and under, because those starry-eyed men, well, they had told him when the star had appeared, take no chances. Let no threat to my rule remain. Kill everyone. No boy can live. He laid on his horn, and moved his bumper all the way up to the, just about touching the car in front of him. How dare that person drive this speed in the fast lane? He flashed his lights. He was cussing and gesturing. And as soon as he had a sliver of space, he scooted right by and he gave the sign of his appreciation to the family in that car that held him back. Studies have shown that our brains, when we are trying to get from point A to point B, all they see of anything in their way is an obstacle. And so when a person is in a hurry and they're in their car, they don't think about a person in that car. All they see is an obstacle, something to move beyond, something that should be out of their way. That's where road rage comes in. But not only that, think about it in the grocery store. When that person parks their cart in the middle of the aisle, how much anger and impatience we can feel over that person. Get out of the way. We don't even see them as a person anymore. They become an obstacle. When we are on a mission, anything between us and our goal is nothing more than an obstacle. To Herod, a baby, even a baby, a helpless baby, was an obstacle to his secure throne. No king of the Jews could be allowed to stand. And so Jesus was an obstacle to the world. With its plans and its desires, its power and its agendas, its narratives and accepted messages, Jesus is an obstacle to our prideful hearts, to our self-righteous pride, to our picking and choosing what parts of the Bible we want to emphasize, what sins are really bad, our desire for God's glorious kingdom to come right here on earth, for a good and prosperous life, well, Jesus is an obstacle. The world can't send the brute squad after Jesus today, but they can they do, and they will try to silence Christians. They may try to erase, all evident, erase him against all evidence from the history books, or maybe they'll try to redefine Jesus into something that fits better into what they want him to be. They plug their ears to his morality a world that today is still shocked by this atrocity of Herod is also the same world that last year killed 42 million unborn babies, some out of desperation, but many out of sheer convenience. The moment Jesus enters a territory that the world wants to protect, he has to go. 
they have to lash out. We want to be a part of this world. We want to get along with this world. We want to get ahead in this world, succeed in this world. And so Jesus often becomes an obstacle for us that we want to push aside and ignore. We have our own desires, our own plans that arise in our hearts that we want to accomplish. And so, yes, we too want to pick and choose what parts of Jesus' message we want to hear. But Jesus has that way of making us all feel a little bit uncomfortable. We pick and choose who is worthy of our love, our support, and our care. And so while we may be outraged by some of the world's atrocities, we turn a blind eye, ignore, maybe even participate in others. We shed a tear for the Holy Family on the run as refugees, and yet we show little pity for those around us without safe homes, safe havens, a place to go when they are in need. We set aside some sins to be my sin. The sin I get to keep as my own little pet, shut away, safe. And if Jesus makes me uncomfortable, if Jesus starts to enter into that territory where I don't want him, well then Jesus has to go. You see, there's only one king we want to rule in this world. There's only one king we want ruling in our hearts, and that king is always me. We are right to be sad about what Herod has done, but we cannot be shocked. We are right to be angry about the evils we see in this world, but we cannot be surprised we are right to be frustrated by the hypocrisy among Christians and especially frightened about the hypocrisy within our own hearts. But let it not scandalize us. For even as a baby, the world would not tolerate Jesus. Even as a baby, he was rejected, hated, threatened, and hunted. The world's fury fell on him. The world's evil took its aim at him. Even as a child, he was entering enemy territory, but he would not leave. He would not leave until his work was complete. Dear Christians, the world is, it always has been, and it always will be a hostile place to the Lord. Our sinful hearts are a hostile place for the king. And yet, he enters the hostile places. He enters all hostile places, places of suffering, places of death, even the darkness of the grave, and he endures. For the sake of his work, because he still had things to accomplish, the Lord spared his son and sent him away into exile in Egypt. But Jesus did not remain there. He returned to the nation that had rejected him. He stayed in a world that hated him. He does the same today. The gospel may fade in some places. It is rejected in some places. Much of the world would love to get rid of this gospel message, would love to stop talking about Jesus at all, and yet Jesus and his love and his promise of salvation, they remain. He stays in a world that hates him. Jesus has not given up on this world. Jesus has not given up on that neighbor that doesn't want to hear about his work. Jesus has not given up on you. Even when your heart hardens, even when you stumble and fall into sin, even when that guilt comes into your life, Jesus remains. Because Jesus enters this world of evil to save this world that hates him. In the newest Star Wars TV series, 
there is a character that has been dubbed Baby Yoda. And he is cute and green like Yoda is. He makes cute little noises. He shuffles around slowly, getting into all sorts of cute little problems. But in those moments of emergency, usually exactly when the plot needs him to, he waves his little Jedi claw in the air and all of a sudden all the problems of that episode are solved. His, the other good guys are all saved. This helpless little creature is so cute and yet so powerful. What's not to like? Why doesn't baby Jesus just wave his hand? We can't understand. God is on earth. He is living in Bethlehem. And then he ran away while dozens of other children are slaughtered. And instead of saving them, it seems they die because Jesus lived among them. Couldn't baby Jesus, God's son, has simply waved his hand and sent those soldiers flying off? Wouldn't the heavenly host, those legions after legions of God's greatest warriors, wouldn't they have been standing by and ready to deploy to protect the Lord and protect all those little babies? Wouldn't God the Father, the Almighty God, couldn't he have sent lightning from heaven and struck those men or shut Herod's mouth before he could give such a despicable order? Or, as he did for Elisha, have struck all those men blind so they couldn't have even found their way to Bethlehem if they had wanted to. He didn't stop these things from happening. Did he fail? Was he powerless? Didn't he care? This question arises in this sinful world. It rises in history as the blood of martyrs has flowed in coliseums, in cities, and in deserted places all around the world. It rises in our own lives when tragedy comes our way. Does God care? What is God doing? Is he powerless why not just wave his hand and make it all better? This lesson certainly raises that question. But my friends, it also answers it for us. For the sixth time in just these first two chapters, Matthew points back to the Old Testament. He points to what God has spoken and says Jesus of Nazareth fulfills it. The promised child to Abraham has come. The sign has been given. The virgin will be with child and he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. God has called his people out of Egypt. He made them his people. He gave them the law. He brought them to the promised land. But they were unfaithful. They did not trust him in the wilderness. They chased after other gods. They forfeited their rest. But now God would again call his son from Egypt the true Israel who would remain faithful, who would trust in the wilderness, who would keep the law every day of his life. When he stood in the Jordan, he opened the promised land for all people. He takes Israel's place in everything, in everything that they needed, even under the wrath of God. He would take their place. Even in these dark days, God saw, as once happened with Assyria, when God's people were taken away, so again those who hate God and his people would make his people weep and cry. Matthew has a singular purpose in these first chapters. He has a greater purpose running through this entire gospel he is showing how in all things God is working according to his plan. 
And in all things, God, Jesus is the fulfillment of everything God has spoken. And so while we don't often understand we, that we wish God would do things differently, although God's plans, his purposes, his grace, and his goodness are often hidden from our sight and from our understanding in this evil world, we know God is not unaware. God is not uncaring. God is not powerless to act. This baby that Herod feared, this man the world rejected, this man with no beauty to attract us to him so that the epitaph Jesus of Nazareth was an insult to say, what could one like him possibly be? How could he be the one God has promised? But Matthew points to this very title. The prophet said he would be rejected and despised. And so he will be called a Nazarene. He, this one, Jesus of Nazareth, God's son in the world, he is the answer to suffering. He is God's triumph over evil. He stands victorious over sin. He stands victorious over death and over the grave so that even in this atrocity, those children who lost their lives for him could join the martyrs waving their palm branches in the air. And they stand eternally spared from the evil terrors of this world. God, his love, his mercy, his power, his wisdom beyond our understanding, he is in control. In Jesus of Nazareth, God's Son in the world, the Lord fulfills all he has spoken. In him, he gives all who are faithful eternal life. Seats taken. This is our territory. No trespassing. Jesus enters a world that the devil thought belonged to him. He enters a world where the powerful think they can do whatever pleases them. He enters a world where hard hearts refuse his rule and hard wills stop at nothing to be rid of him. But he enters a world where God is still in control. This is his territory. And he comes here to win it back. He enters hearts, and there he dwells and makes his home. He not only reclaims this world, he not only reclaims our hearts, even history from sin, death, and the devil, but he opens a way to the territory where we don't belong. Jesus makes heaven. And he makes the new heavens and the new earth. He makes them your territory, your home forever. Amen. Please rise. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 